What does it mean to go fast? Ludicrous speed! Go! Fiction is obsessed with speed. You see speed in movies, in books, in TV shows, in video games, and even right here on YouTube. You could be watching a show having nothing to do with speed, and suddenly there's a racing episode where only the fastest can win. Whether it's something as complex as light speed travel, or as simple as driving a car fast, the possibilities of where speed can show up are endless. But why is that the case? Why the united media obsession with what goes the fastest? In truth, the media wouldn't have any legs to stand on without us. Fiction is obsessed with speed because non-fiction is obsessed with speed. And we as humans have a need for speed. Humans are the fastest animals on Earth. With the advent of cars and spaceships, I doubt anyone would doubt that fact. Humans have engineered a world of speed that they still command to this day. But it wasn't always like that. Although humans now are on top of the speed gauge, back in the old days, humans were very primitive. The most technically advanced trick they knew was hitting things with sticks and bones. In reality, the queen of speed was nature itself. Nature had a more dominating presence before humans. She always seemed to have a leg up against them. Or more specifically, she seemed to have four legs up against humans. Meet the cheetah, the fastest land animal on Earth. Light body weight, combined with their small heads and four legs, allows them to reach sprint speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. Their flexible spines allow for extreme extension during a sprint, helping them rotate their hips and scapula in a way that incentivizes speed over anything else. Truly, the cheetah topped the speed charts at the time, and still does if you don't include humans. And although there have never been any cases of cheetahs competing with or attacking early humans, it's likely humans were starting to get a little jealous of the cheetah's unrelenting speed. The human response was the wheel. Attributed to the ancient Mesopotamians somewhere between the 40th and 43rd century BC, the wheel was a groundbreaking discovery in agriculture, transport, and more importantly, speed. Though the wheel was always groundbreaking, you might not have expected it wasn't always used for speed. In truth, the wheel was originally used for pottery. It wasn't until some smart people decided to duct tape it to their carts that they realized it was groundbreaking in other ways. When four of these legendary first wheels were attached to a cart in a certain formation, it allowed the cart to be pulled and pushed easily, and gave it the ability to hold large, heavy objects more efficiently than just carrying them by hand. With the wheel in their grasps, the ancient Mesopotamians went bonkers. They used it to transport food, goods, and even people. And soon the wheel spread, and the whole world became obsessed with it. However, despite how innovative the wheel was, there was just one little problem. Having people pull and push these carts may have been the best option at the time, but humans weren't really made to push and pull large, heavy objects 24-7, even on wheels. And once you factor in malnourishment and exhaustion, using people to push wheels suddenly became a very topical issue. Thus, it was up to the Mesopotamians once again to perfect their invention. Enter the Chariot. Everyone today is familiar with the concept of horses pulling large, extravagant chariots day and night, and horses may have seemed like an obvious choice for what to pull these slowly advancing carts with. But surprisingly, they weren't. The Mesopotamians' first candidate weren't horses, but donkeys. Donkeys were put onto each and every chariot in the land, and though they hoped donkeys would make transport faster, they may have just done the opposite. Donkeys might have been better than people when it came to transporting goods over difficult terrain. However, donkeys are slow. Very slow. They're easily startled by loud noises, and require a lot more food than humans do. So the hunt for the best chariot candidate was still underway. And as Mesopotamians were still mingling about with donkeys, others had taken the lead. The steppe peoples were not a single group of people. They were a diverse and disunified set of nomads who roamed the Eurasian steppe. The one thing they had in common were their horses. Wild horses were first domesticated in the steppe, and they held a great deal of importance in steppe culture. So once the technology the Mesopotamians had invented reached the outer reaches of the steppe, the nomads got right to work seeing if they could improve it. One particular group, the Sintashta, invented the first spoked wheels. A wheel with a number of rods radiating from the center of the wheel, connecting the center with the round traction surface. This new invention allowed lighter, faster chariots, able to be pulled by a larger variety of animals. 
and right away, the steppe nomads chose horses. And forever onwards, horses would be associated with chariots. Once word got around that these nomads majorly improved chariots in a groundbreaking way, cultures everywhere began adopting spoke wheels and horses. With lighter, faster chariots able to hit up to 40 miles per hour, humans began experimenting with other ways these chariots could be used. And these experiments would develop a disturbing new use for horse chariots. Humans are inherently insecure animals. If somebody has better technology than you, or a better food source, access to water, they begin to get jealous. They want to take it for themselves. With technology advancing this quickly, some cultures were bound to use these new technologies for nefarious purposes. Enter the War Chariot. The invention of War Chariots corrupted horse chariots originally used for travel, agriculture, and transport for a new, fourth function. These War Chariots were used in wars, obviously. <laughs> Pulled by one, two, even three horses at the time, these War Chariots were mighty beasts of the battlefield. Usually accompanied by two occupants, the first would aim the chariot towards its destination, while the second would lob spears towards attackers, before impaling them on sight. They were truly tyrants of the battlefield, and not to be messed with. And if you didn't have war chariots, well, you were out of luck! Thus began the first arms race in history. Soon every culture started developing their own version of war chariots, but none stood above all the others quite like the Romans. Whenever you think of chariots, it's likely ancient Romes that come to mind. The Romans were so obsessed with chariots that they used them not only on the battlefield as weapons, but in the Colosseum as spectacles. Spectators could have the chance to watch as a mix of criminals and high-ranking officials seeking their 15 minutes of fame duel it out in a long and grueling race to the finish. Chariot crashes were frequent, and teams had to be sent in to pick up the rubble. Through all of this, audiences loved it, and I'm sure increasing their socioeconomic status as a reward makes it so the winners loved it too. Through the centuries, other animals were added to chariots as well, such as Hannibal's famous elephants. But for practical use, horses reigned supreme, four hooves at the top of the podium. They stood for years. Through the centuries, due to slow technological progress, methods of achieving speeds faster than chariots weren't really thought of. Inventors were mainly trying to survive the constant conflicts and religious persecution. This era of technological fallback would persist until the 17th century. Realizing its longer duration and density, Europeans began switching from wood to coal. This caused coal demand to skyrocket, leaving coal miners to dig further down into the earth. Sometimes unexpectedly, miners would hit underground water deposits and these coal mines would become suddenly and quickly flooded. So many mines were flooding that an inventor had to be called in to solve the problem. In 1609, Hieronimo de Allianz registered the first patent for a machine that used steam power to propel water from mines. He would use his newly dubbed steam engine to remove water from silver mines in Guadalcanal, Seville. Eventually, word of this new steam power technology would get around. In 1712, when an inventor by the name of Thomas Newcomen would invent the first commercially available steam engine. And in 1762, another inventor by the name of James Watt would perfect Newcomen's already perfected modifications. You might have heard of him. The Watt was named after him. Soon after Watt, yet another inventor would take his double perfected invention and perfect it even more. Robert Fulton would take Watt steam engines and put them onto boats, historically a very sluggish medium of travel, now almost hitting 40 miles per hour. And as technology progressed, steamboats could even overtake chariots as the fastest vehicle. Thus began a technologic arms race between the land and the sea, with each side eager to experiment new ways to hit faster speeds. You see, the sea is very much different from the land. While land is made up of a variety of rolling hills and troublesome mountains, the sea is flat everywhere, meaning it was faster to travel by sea on a steamboat than travel by land on rocky terrain. Though, the sea did have its detriments. The reason ships were so historically sluggish is because water is very much heavier than air, and requires a lot more force to pass through than traveling on land does. So, in theory, Land could be better than sea as long as the terrain was preferable, and unlike the sea, humans could exploit the terrain of the land much easier. <laughs> Thus led to the creation of trains. An import from the British, trains eliminated the threat of hard to traverse terrain by putting a series of train tracks upon a newly flattened bed of land to provide a predetermined, unopposed path to their destinations. These towering and noble behemoths drew across the land and expanded nearly everywhere, with their partner tracks appearing near any large city. 
their massive, bellowing cries signaling a new era of transport. In due time, with enough train tracks laid out, trains surpassed steam engines as the dominant mode of travel, and by the year 1850, surpassed even cheetahs as the fastest beings on Earth with a speed of 78 miles per hour. Finally, humans had triumphed nature. We single-handedly surpassed the fastest animal on Earth, and now we ourselves were the fastest animals on Earth. We had become the wielders of speed, and we would go only faster from there. The 20th century brought forth a new era of speed, and a new set of tools to the table. Though a new invention, the car, had been made 16 years before the century, they became more widely available to the general public within it. Cars upended society, replacing roads originally meant for people, and allowing those same people to reach further distances more efficiently. People started worrying less about the journey, and more about the destination. But there were some among them that still cared about the journey in some way. It wasn't long before cars became weapons of speed, too. In the United States, the 18th Amendment was ratified on January 17, 1919, and the prohibition of all alcohol went into effect 365 days later. The amendment made illegal the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol across the United States. Yet, despite the banning of alcohol, it was still a widespread part of the Roaring Twenties, and it was made that way thanks to the bootleggers. Bootleggers were drivers who illegally transported alcohol across the country. They'd make deliberate modifications to their vehicle in order to increase their speed and get a leg up against the cops. While driving these modified, or stock, cars, they could attain speeds of over 180 miles per hour and zoom past police caught in the dust. Prohibition lasted only 13 years, and after its appeal in 1933, there was still a supply of these cars out in the wild. With no cops to run from, the ex-bootleggers only had to run from each other. Thus began the era of race cars. Racing these high-performance cars became a popular pastime in North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, and elsewhere in the southern United States. They raced each other's cars out in the country on makeshift dirt tracks, as were the bootlegger routes of the stock car. This practice would evolve into the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, or NASCAR, in 1947. You might have heard of them. Over the decades, these race cars increased in speed, reaching over the 200 mile per hour limit. However, the era of high speed race cars would come to an end in 1987, when a car, the Winston 500 at Talladega Raceway, suddenly flew off and crashed into the front stretch catch fence at a high enough speed to destroy almost 100 feet of the fence. At the following race next year, to avoid any other catastrophes, NASCAR mandated the use of the restrictor plate, a device installed at the engine to limit the power and speed of a car. With cars slowly on decline, and ships still caught at the mercy of the sea, there emerges a third frontier for the limits of human speed, the sky. Unlike the sea or the land, the sky has very little resistance at all. Without any friction from the ground, the upper bar for speed is much higher, allowing distances to be traveled in less time. The brothers Orville and Wilbur noticed this, and spent four years of research and development to create the first successful airplane, the 1903 Wright Flyer. It first flew at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on December 17, 1903, with Orville at the controls. The plane flew 120 feet in 12 seconds, and achieved a height of 10 feet off the ground. The Wright Flyer's success sparked a deep interest in the Third Frontier's capabilities for flight, travel, and speed. In August 1939, the turbojet-powered Heinkel 178 became the world's first jet aircraft. In the midst of World War II, it was the first war to utilize jets in combat. These superpowered jets could reach speeds of 372 miles per hour, and were used in the bombings of multiple cities. After the dust settled and the war was over, governments around the world began perfecting these jets continually. The first aircraft to break the sound barrier was the American Bell X-1, piloted by Chuck Yeager, which cruised at a nice, casual 768 miles per hour. As planes kept advancing and became readily available to the public, some wondered how else these maximum speed planes could be utilized. Some turned to their most wondrous imaginations. Some people pointed to the moon and said, hey, why don't we go there? Unlike the sea, land, or sky, space has no friction whatsoever, and theoretically, the maximum speeds possible could be achieved there too. Thus, a fourth frontier was opened, and the space race had begun. In 1957, the first satellite, Sputnik, was constructed by the Soviet Union and sent into outer space. Following this, a long standoff occurred between the United States and the Soviet Union on which country could innovate space and space travel better than the other. Despite what you may have thought, 
The space race wasn't a cooperative operation with the end goal of furthering humanity and expanding our reach to the wild heights, but really just one giant propaganda contest between two rival nations. And what makes propaganda better than having faster ships than the other? In 1972, the Apollo 17 mission was launched by the United States in an attempt to land on the moon. The Apollo 17 rocket flew at approximately 1.03 miles a second or 3,735 miles an hour, and it was due to its speed that it reached the moon on time. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Later on, in 1998, the first piece of the International Space Station was launched into orbit and would be fit for human passengers in two years. 254 miles from the surface of the Earth, the ISS is a groundbreaking multinational collaborative project involving multiple space agencies and dozens of countries across the globe. It is the largest artificial object in space and is regularly visible to the naked eye from the Earth's surface. And on top of all that, the ISS has a speed of 17,138 miles per hour, circling the Earth in roughly 93 minutes and completing 15 and a half orbits per day. But by far, the fastest thing ever created is the Parker Solar Probe, a probe launched by NASA in 2018 with the mission of touching the Sun, that is, making observations of the outer corona of the Sun. It is slated to arrive by 2025, and is traveling at a speed of 428,748.123 miles per hour, or 0.064% the speed of light. And there it is, the complete human history of speed. Through all of our frontiers, be it sky or sound, one we have never managed to break is light. Light travels at an astounding speed of near 300 million miles per second, and we've only barely scratched the surface of a speed moving that fast. Humans have always been inherently interested in speed, to the point where we send humans and probes off into distant locations with the aim of reaching large numbers of speed. But even before our days of speed, we were ambitious. We take risks, make dire choices. Humans have always been about reaching our maximum potential through whatever means necessary. There isn't a frontier anywhere in the world left untouched. Some believe we can never break the speed of light. I believe it's not completely off the table, and that our future civilizations may find a way, through the same ways we always have, genius, technology, and ambition. So, to answer the question of, what does it mean to go fast, I'd say it's rooted in our very human need to aspire to be the best there ever was, to go down in history, and to be remembered. This has been Dabs All Over. Remember to eat fresh. Just don't go to Subway because it's anything but fresh. Have a great day.